All right, welcome everyone. Thank you for coming and thank you for being here online as well for our final session um, of this popular education series on the American Indian Movement. Before we get started into our agenda this evening, just wanna share a little bit more about myself um, and this project. So my name is Celeste Martinez. I'm the founder and owner of Celestia Alegria and I work with individuals and organizations to ignite joy through transformation. Before I became a life coach, facilitator, and racial equity consultant through Celestia Alegria, I was a community organizer for 10 years. My organizing career started as a student, actually here at Regis University, and then continued to expand in, a, in varying roles with nonprofit organizations here in the Denver metro area. Throughout my nonprofit experience, I was exposed to various organi organizing methodologies, processes on how to organize that were proven to be effective in various local communities in Colorado, as well as across the country. My personal, professional, and educational opportunities informed how I approached this research project and this series. So a little bit more about this project. Learning from our past can help us to shape our reality and our future. Learning from history is an antidote to individualism because it recognizes that our efforts for justice are intergenerational of those who came before, those who are here now, and the generations to come. In the fall of 2020, the Colorado Trust reached out to me to create a report to support their current grant program known as Building and Bridging Power. One of the guiding questions for this report was, what kinds of organizing models are most common in the Colorado landscape? In answering this question, the intent was for the Colorado Trust staff leading the Building and Bridging Power program to be more informed so they could continue to support grantees and connecting with potential resources and opportunities, especially since several grassroots organizations were in the process of developing or redefining their organizing programs. The approach I used to answer this question was which schools of thought are behind the majority of community organizing models in our state and why? And this resulted in explaining the origin of Solinsky's community organizing methodology because several of the most common models are either directly informed by this original methodology or are derivatives of this ideology. This is not only common here in Colorado, but also nationally across the nonprofit sector. And additionally, this trend is reflected in the history of how Solinsky's methodology established credibility and was then institutionalized into a profession in the nonprofit sector. One of the ways that Alinsky furthered cre credibility of his methodology around community organizing was distinguishing his method from that of black indigenous people of color and social movements that they led. This created a wedge between the two social movements and community organizing, making these forms of power building efforts appear to be completely different. As um, this continued, it's created a racial inequality where black indigenous people of color led efforts and especially social movements are not recognized as a form of power building or sometimes even organizing in the nonprofit sector as well as in some forms of academia. As a result, many organizers and community leaders do not learn from the, this history and present power building efforts. This then stifles our power building efforts and can make local organizing efforts predictable to decision makers that we are up against. And this holds us back from looking at these stories to inform us and to have sources of inspiration. So the purpose of this project and our evening together is that um, this body of historical and sociological research is to ensure that present and future generations of community organizers and leaders can draw inspiration from this research and center the stories of social movements led by black, indigenous, and people of color, also referred to as BIPOC, and how these mov movements often collaborated and were in solidarity with one another in the fight 
for racial and social justice. Therefore, with the financial support of the Colorado Trust, I had the opportunity to develop two research papers. One was on the impacts of Solinsky's methodology on community organizing and BIPOC-led efforts. And the second, which focuses on this series, is around historical BIPOC social movements in the US and Colorado. And this paper includes summaries, um, both nationally and Colorado history for civil rights, the Black Panther Party, American Indian Movement, Chicano Movement, and the San Luis Lands Rights Struggle. And this is why we're here today, to learn from the stories of collaboration and overlap between BIPOC-led social movements in Colorado. And this fall series focused on each of these social movements. We began with Civil Rights and Black Panthers. We then um, covered San Luis land rights. Our last session was on the Chicano movement. And here we are today to discuss the American Indian movement. Um, each one of our sessions, including this one, includes a lecture that shares the origins of the movement, core leaders and significant events and actions, followed by a panel of people who are either directly involved in these movements, are family members of leaders who were involved, and are our present day historians and archivists. Which brings me to introduce our panelists for this evening, Donna Chris John and Dr. Angela Parker, who are incredible Native women doing exceptional work in our community. Um, and we'll get to learn more from them a little bit later. But with that, let's jump into the historical aspect of the American Indian movement. Before we talk about the movement, it's important for us to first understand the terminology of what we're using and the term around American Indian. If this terminology is a reference to any of the Aboriginal peoples, the original peoples of the Western Hemisphere, also referred to as the Americas, or here in North America as Turtle Island, and other terms that are used interchangeably with American Indian are Indian, Native American, Indigenous, and Native. Unlike other racial terms, American Indians are from many different tribes with their own unique languages and cultures. Throughout this lecture, you will hear me use the terminology of American Indian, Native American, Indigenous, and Native when referencing groups of people who represent multiple tribes and nations, as well as the names of specific tribes and nations as we move through this timeline of history. So what inspired the American Indian movement? Let's gain some more context on what were the conditions that created what was ripe for the American Indian movement to um, emerge. Some of these, in a broad summary, are colonization and conquest of the Americas, US treaty violations, policies, and programs for Indian termination, and forced assimilation into whiteness. So let's first describe what is colonization. This definition is informed by the work of Roxanne Dubard Ortiz and her work of an indigenous people's history of the United States. And colonization is to establish a colony, forcing people off their land, and then exploiting those who are displaced for their labor to support and expand the wealth and power of a European country. What's important to understand about colonization is that this is a process that began its experimentation to create an effective strategy of violence and a culture of violence um, all the way before common era times. And so a lot of what we see in colonization, even in the legacy of today, stems back from Roman colonization, which is why our timeline actually starts there. But from Roxanne Dumbart Ortiz's work, she describes that settler colonialism as an institution or system requires violence to attain its goals. People do not hand over their land, resources, children, and duties without a fight. And that fight is often met with violence. In employing the force necessary to accomplish this expansionist goals, a colonizing regime institutionalizes violence. The reason why I wanted to share this particular quote is it's important to understand that colonium, colonialism was created and established as an institution, as an economic system, through violently taking away people from their land, 
um, disconnecting people from their culture, and then creating false narratives around that. And Roxanne Dumbarton Ortiz describes this, how the process of colonization essentially made land into private property. This concept did not exist before that. White supremacy also emerged to neutralize class tensions because people became landless and were facing destruction around their culture and their identity. And so in creating race as a concept, this allowed for people to then access rights and privileges within their society. And lastly, we have terminal narratives, which is especially comes to part of what is important when we talk about the history of American Indians here in the United States. Terminal narratives are false narratives or alternatives about what colonization and conquest were. Oftentimes, we learn about Europeans coming to the Americas. We're told that Europeans brought disease with them and they wiped out indigenous populations. And while yes, disease was a factor in what caused death to indigenous people across the Americas, as well as the death of many African enslaved people who were transported on ships during the transatlantic slave trade. To say this was the main contributing factor for declining populations of indigenous people is a lie. This is to cover up how central violence was and still is to the culture of conquest. And that culture is of violence, expropriation, destruction, and dehumanization. And as Dumbar Ortiz articulates in her research, she describes how nearly all the population areas of the Americas were reduced by 90% following the onset of colonization projects, decreasing targeted indigenous populations of the Americas from 100 million to 10 million. So what we're, what we're talking about here as far as the condition stems this far back and continues to impact Native communities today because this was also established not just into our institutions and our laws, but in the culture of what it means to be a part of this particular country. It's created a culture of conquest, which relies on unrelenting warfare against indigenous peoples. And this has looked like tactics of starvation, massacres of civilians, including women, children, and elders, um, the practice of scalp hunting, and enslavement of, of children as well as others, and additionally, a dependence on African slavery to uphold this culture and to make this effective. Um, something that I want to mention as far as this culture for us to kind of conceptualize and understand is around this piece around scalp hunting. Um, this practice began during the Picot War in 1636 through 1638, where Connecticut and Massachusetts state officials offered bounties in exchange for the heads of murdered indigenous people. And this practice continued and became more routine, even in the absence of war with indigenous people and, and nations. By the mid 1970s, those who were collecting bounty rewards found that scalps were more portable for larger numbers. And additionally, Dumbar Ortiz described that scalps of indigenous children um, became a means of exchange of currency and also a means to eradicate indigenous populations. The settlers gave name to mutilated bloody corpses they left behind as redskins. The reason why I name this is because we can still see the visual, um, we still hear this language within our culture today. And we still see high expressions of violence towards indigenous people. Which brings us then to the US treaty violations, policies and programs for Indian termination. So we have to go back to 1976 to 1832, where a series of treaties were established, over 100 in fact, between American Indian nations and the US. And these treaties were initially to establish borders and prescribe conditions of behavior between both the US and um, indigenous nations. However, 
um, what we have seen is that um, those have not been honored and continuously violated over time. By 1824, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, also referred to as the BIA, was established. By May 28th of 1930, the Indian Removal Act was signed into law by President Andrew Jackson, which gave US presidents the authority to grant land west of the Mississippi River in what is modern day Oklahoma in exchange for indigenous lands east of the river. Originally, relocation to new established territories was voluntary, but then American Indians were forcibly removed from their lands by the US military. By 1832, American Indian nations were considered to be domestic, which required for treaties to be approved by US Congress. So changing the rules and the landscape. By 1835, the Cherokee were among many American Indian nations who strongly resisted relocation of their homelands. President Andrew Jackson was adamant about requiring their indigenous lands so he negotiated with a subsect of, Cher of the Cherokee Nation and established the Treaty of New Ekota, where money was exchanged for the land with the agreement that the Cherokee would relocate to identified lands in Oklahoma. While the Cherokee Nation as a whole was not in agreement with the Treaty of Ekota, this did not hinder the United States government from enforcing it leading to forcibly removing the Cherokee from their homelands to a thousand mile march where 4,000 members of the nation died, a fourth of the nation's population at, of the time. And this forced march, which also caused great suffering to the Chickasaw, Choctaw, Creek, and Seminole nations, is more commonly referred to as the Trail of Tears. By 1851, U.S. Congress passed the Indian Appropriations Act, which created the reservation system. Native people were forced to live on a territory of land, also referred to as a reservation. And the reservation may or may not be the original lands of their ancestors, depending on the interests of the United States government, who also set restrictions on Native people's ability to hunt, fish, and gather traditional foods. By 1871, the Congress House of Representatives ceased to recognize American Indian nations within US territory as independent nations. And this is largely significant because before treaties established that recognition. And then later in 1924, Indian citizenship was passed by US Congress granting citizenship for the first time to American Indians and affirming tribal affiliation and rights. However, this act did not guarantee the right to vote and overall did not have a great impact on the daily lives of American Indians, which um, constantly was a point of contention and focus, especially post-World War II. This legislation was largely influenced though by the advocacy of Mission Indian Federation established by a group of American Indians from Southern California who had been working towards advocating for citizenship since 1919 and many who came before. In 1934, the Indian Reorganization Act, also referred to as the Indian New Deal, came after the Great Depression, which attempted to revitalize tribal governments, promote tribal welfare, and further preserve American Indian cultures. So we're seeing like a pivot, right? After almost 100 years of not trying to preserve or further welfare and culture of indigenous peoples. By 1939 to 1945, roughly 70,000 American Indians served in all branches of the US military in World War II, including the Navajo Code Talkers, which veteran, and when veterans returned though, um, after their time of service to reservation, they found even worse conditions of poverty than they left before. And many times um, the benefits of veterans would be held up due to the racism that American Indians continued to face within this country. By 1952 through 1972, American Indian herbal relocation was created by the US federal government and the BIA to end all support of American Indian tribes and their reservations 
by incentivizing American Indians to mo move into urban cities such as Chicago, Denver, Los Angeles, Cleveland, and Seattle, as well as others. So their lands on their reservation could be acquired by the US. While this did not succeed in the primary goal to terminate American Indians, now almost two thirds of American Indians live in urban cities. And additionally, this pol policy created a series of long lasting impacts where American Indians in cities continue to face discrimination in schools, housing, increased experiences with police brutality, incarceration, um, and many other challenges. From 1953 to 1970, the US government also enacted 60 separate termination proceedings against American Indian tribes, and this resulted into over 3 million acres of tribal lands being eliminated. So just to kind of visualize for ourselves, when we talk about this span of history in 1810, the purple we can see is all native lands, and the yellow is stolen land. And so as we see over time rapidly, just in the matter of 40 years, almost half of native lands were stolen. And as we fast forward to 2020, we can see how native lands continue to be stolen and to continue to be shrinking as far as representation of native people. Which brings us into the next component of what inspired the conditions for the American Indian movement. And this has to do with forced assimilation into whiteness. Now, while I speak to these three things, what's important to understand is that these are policies and programs that existed. However, the acts of violence that happened to people who were living during these times um, was, was continuous and is not encompassed in, in what I'm going to share. So from 1819 to 1969, Indian boarding schools were established by the US government but also run by several Christian church denominations that forced American Indian children to assimilate into Euro-American society or white culture. These schools intentionally separated native children from their families. It would intimidate parents if they did not send their children by um, potentially withholding rations of food or other basic needs for their family and forcing children to assimilate, where they were subjected to violent consequences if they refused to do so. Children were also subjected to physical and sexual and emotional abuses at these schools, especially for speaking their native languages. The impact caused generations of American Indians to experience a loss of language, disconnection from cultural teachings, way of life, homelands, and a loss of connection to spiritual rituals and practices. By 1887, the Dawes Act, also referred to as the General Allotment Act, was established by the US federal government into law. And the inspiration of this law came from Americans who believed assimilation of American Indians was the solution for their lust for land and Western expansion of the country. Ultimately, this authorized the US president to break up reservation land into small allotments to be parceled out to individuals. And this practice, although contrary to the traditional ways of the majority of American Indian nations, was effective at further shrinking assigned territories, including those who were forcibly relocated. And this law additionally banned the cultural and spiritual practices of American Indians. Lastly, in 1890, the ghost dance, which was a spiritual movement, was outlawed with a massacre that took place at Wounded Knee. And the ghost dance started as a spiritual movement of many American Indians that advocated for peaceful coexistence with non-Indians. However, the Lakota Sioux prophesied that practicing the ritual would actually remove non-Indians from their land. As a result, Indian agents, band, American Indians banded together um, and practiced the ghost dance, but President Harrison ordered a third of the army to descend on Wounded Knee in 1819 and 90, um, massacring hundreds of Sioux, including elders, women, and children. 
the fear of violence then led to the decline of the ghost dance ritual and the spiritual movement overall. So all of these events, all of these different programs, all of these different aspects, then essentially created the conditions that fast forward us to 1968, when the history of the American Indian Movement began. On July 28th of 1968, Dennis Banks and George Mitchell, who are attributed as, the co as some of the co-founders of the American Indian Movement, organized a meeting for American Indians to discuss issues impacting their community and what to do about it. In, um, this is in Minneapolis, Minnesota. This is referred to as the first American Indian Movement meeting, although they were not referring to themselves quite yet as that where about 200 people were in attendance and the community des decided to focus their efforts on police um, brutality and accountability because of the severity of police brutality that people were facing on a day-to-day -day basis. Among those who attended was Clyde Belcourt, who uh, previously led an organization known as the Red Ghetto People from 1964 and who then later served as the first chairman of AIM. The focus on police brutality and accountability inspired the first initiative with the community patrol known as the AIM Patrol, using three cars painted in red to monitor police in key areas that were known for harassing American Indians across the Twin Cities. What's important to understand about also the context of this history and who some of these co-founders were, Dennis Banks um, was, um, previously incarcerated uh, before this time. And during that time while he was incarcerated, he experienced a deep uh, politicization or a radicalization, if you will, and really reflected on what was happening at the time, the Vietnam War, seeing the emergence of uh, both civil rights movement as well as Black Panthers, the Chicano movement. And in seeing all of these different efforts and initiatives, Dennis Banks, at least in his autobiography, attributes to himself that he thought about, well, what about American Indians? Where is a space for us to come together to fight for our rights and to assert our voice in this moment of time? And so as he left that time of being incarcerated, he felt very charged and reached out to his friend George Mitchell, who he had known throughout his whole life um, and even served in the military with, um, to, to see what could be possible. And essentially that's what created an aspect or at least one perspective of what created um, the catalyst for how AIM began to get started. In 1969, Dennis Banks sought out Lakota medicine man Henry Crowdog to learn spiritual ceremonies. Although Banks was Ojibwa, he was not connected to elders and medicine people of his nation because of his boarding school experience. However, after Banks' time with Crow Dog, he felt that centering spiritual rituals and tradition was important for AIM. So he consulted Clyde Belcourt, the first AIM chairman, on how they could incorporate spirituality into the fabric of their movement. By November of 1969 and through July of 1971, Alcatraz occupation was led by American Indians of the Bay Area through an organization called Indians of All Tribes, Inc. This occupation in pro was in protest of the United States government's termination policies that were active at this time. And while the occupation began, Clyde Belcourt, Dennis Banks, George Mitchell traveled from Minneapolis to lend their support. This is seen as one of um, the, the, the most attributed actions of American Indians that then inspired and catalyzed some of the other occupations that would be to come in the years to come where American Indians were asserting themselves to reclaim their native lands. By 1917, a legal rights center was created in Minneapolis to support American Indians facing legal issues. And here in Colorado, Vernon Belcourt, the brother of Clyde Belcourt, as well as Joe Locust of the Cherokee Nation, helped to establish the Denver AIM chapter in 1970, which was one of the first amongst seven chapters across the country. By 1971, 
um, the first AIM national conference was organized where leaders started to develop a strategy and vision for their movement. From 1972 to 1976, Dickie Wilson assumed the role of tribal chairman of the Pine Ridge Reservation in 1972. Wilson spent a great deal of the government's monies funding a private army of 80 people he liked to refer to as his goons, which stands for Guardians of the Ogallala Nation. This army, however, funded by the US government, was often used to target residents of the reservation, not to protect them. And during Wilson's administration, more than 60 Ogallala Sioux were killed by the goons. To maintain power, Wilson committed voter fraud and used goons as a force to intimidate anyone who would question his authority. Also in 1972, the Heart of the Earth Survival School opened in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and then later the Red House School in St. Paul, Minnesota. These were K through 12 schools that focused on addressing the high dropout rates of American Indian students in the Twin Cities and provided them with culturally relevant curriculum overseen um, by the parental involvement. By February 14th of this, this same year, Raymond Yellow Thunder, a 51-year-old Lakota man, was murdered by two white men named Leslie and Melvin Hare. Yellow Thunder was publicly beaten and forced to dance naked at gunpoint at the Gordon American Legion Post number 34 in Gordon, Nebraska. An AIM was gathered in Oklahoma at the time of Yellow Thunder's murder, and they organized a caravan to the Pine Ridge Reservation to demand justice. The Hare brothers were ultimately convicted of manslaughter, the lowest charge possible, and each served several years in prison. And this was seen as a victory for AIM to hold people accountable for the violence that members of their community were facing. By September, AIM and several other American Indian organizations gathered in Denver, Colorado at the New Albany Hotel to organize a national march known as the Trail of Broken Treaties. This was a call of attention onto how the BIA continued to inhibit tribes and treat American Indians as wards of the state, as well as the 372 treaty violations that were at the time with the US government. Given this was an election year, AIM believed that this action was extremely timely to uplift a 20 point platform. And these caravans joined from across the country in Minneapolis, where then demonstrators continued onward to DC. Seeing that um, the original gathering to, to strategize around this action happened in Denver, the Denver chapter, under the leadership of Alice Blackhorse of the Hukpapa Dakota, Red Senador of the Blackfeet and Oneida Nations, and Vernon Belcourt of the Ojibwe and Ashinabe, designed a bumper sticker titled Aim for Sovereignty. This messaging greatly influenced um, the language then used in AIM, as well as some of the, the concepts around their 20 point platform. And the reason why creating this bumper sticker is worth mentioning is not just the influence of language, but then the widespread understanding of what people were, were fighting for. By November 2nd through um, the 7th, 700, um, sorry, from November 2nd to the 7th, of 1972, 700 American Indians from over 200 tribes and two dozen Indian organizations participated in the Trail of Broken Treaties and arrived in Washington, DC. Although AIM confirmed meetings with a series of federal departments and offices before arriving in order to address uh, issues pertaining to American Indians, every single one of the offices and departments canceled. Largely from the inspiring words of Martha Grass, AIM members decided to occupy the BIA building and continued to do so for five days. While the US government originally agreed by the end of this occupation to form a committee to review and work on the 20 point platform that was developed, the US government did not follow through. But this action was still seen as a success because of the unity that was demonstrated across 
so many nations and organizations. In December of 1972, AIM alongside the Ogallala Sioux shut down the business district of Rapid City, South Dakota by picketing to denounce sexual harassment of native women and discrimination towards native elders. Fights later broke out at businesses and in the streets, resulting in the arrest of about 200 AIM members. Crow Dog later led a group of natives to dance and sing war songs around the jail. Wilson reached out, um, Dickie Wilson reached out to the U.S. for reinforcements, and they sent 80 U.S. marshals with machine guns to descend on Rapid City. By 1973, AIM had expanded to 79 chapters, eight of which were in Canada, with a membership of 5,000 people. By January 12th, the Denver FBI office reported that Alice Blackhorse, leader of the chapter, was killed in a car accident with no additional details. This is something that is further expanded on in the work of Ernesto Vigil and the Crusade for Justice, um, which actually covers more of the local history of the Chicano movement. And after the death of Blackhorse, further information on leadership of Denver AIM chapter is difficult to identify. What is known is that the Denver AIM chapter and the Crusade for Justice continued to work in close solidarity, demonstrating support to one another in both local and national efforts happening in both the American Indian movement and the Chicano movement from across the Southwest. In 1973, from January 20th to 21st, Wesley Bad Hart Bull and his mother Sarah with a friend, Robert High Eagle, were at Bill's Bar in Buffalo Gallup, South Dakota. Wesley was warned not to come to the bar by the owner, but continued to go anyway. And Daryl Schmitz, a local white gas attendant who frequented the bar, was drunk and threatened to kill Wesley as he left that night. The next day, Wesley was found in front of Bill's Bar with a knife in his chest and seven stab wounds. Wesley died on the way to the hospital, and Schmitz was admitted to killing Wesley and was arrested and taken to Custer, um, where he was then charged with second-degree manslaughter, again, the lowest offense possible. However, Schmitz was released on bail and never spent any time in jail. Um, given this moment and the impacts that this had, um, AIM decided to lend their support to Sarah um, his mother, and demand justice for Wesley. There was already actions um, merging with civil rights violations that were to be heard um, on February 3rd and 4th from events that had previously happened in Rapid City, Pentington County, and the state of South Dakota. And many Indians um, gathered to actually offer their testimony in this court hearing. On February 6th, um, AIM caravaned with 50 people from Rapid City to Custer in a blizzard for an, the arraignment of Schmitz. Judge Gates initially refused to let anyone into the courthouse, but AIM leaders were successful at negotiating for letting about five people inside, which included their lawyer. AIM leaders demanded for the charges to be changed, but Judge Gates refused. When AIM leaders informed supporters outside in the snow about the refusal of Judge Gates, the crowd attempted to break down the door of the courthouse in outrage and met, were met with 50 state troopers in full riot gear, causing a violent fright to outbreak. 22 people were arrested that day, including Sarah Bad Hart Bull, and Sarah was later tried and charged for riot with arson and she served five and a half years in prison. Schmitz, on the other hand, was ultimately acquitted by an all-white jury and did not spend a single day in jail for the murder of Wesley. By February 27th, the Ogallala Sioux called on AIM for their support as violent repression escalated by Wilson at Pine Ridge Reservation, and they gathered at the community center in Calico, South Dakota. Chief Frank Fools Crow, Pine Ridge's oldest but most respected medicine man, declared that this was an important time to fight back. Many women present, such as Ellen Moves Camp, Gladys Bissonette, 
Lou Bean, Hildegard Catches, urged those gathered to take immediate action. Bissonnette suggested the group head to Wounded Knee. After those gathered came to consensus, 200 Ogallala Sioux, with the support of AIM leaders, headed to Wounded Knee, beginning the 71-day occupation. They were immediately met with over 100 heavily armed U.S. Marshals. Where um, those participating in the occupation were urged to maintain a unified agenda and that no shots be fired unless for self-defense. A daily newsletter was set up so that everyone in the camp had access to the latest information and me messages and of encouragement from supporters. Sweat ceremonies took place daily and all participating in the occupation also participated in the spiritual ritual to fortify themselves. Crow Dog, who was present at the occupation, also encouraged the revival of the ghost dance ritual. This four-day ritual was set up in an area outside of the site of the federal um, officials that surrounded the area. And it was the first time that the ghost dance had been practiced since it had been outlawed after the 1980 massacre at Wounded Knee. And these images come from um, the autobiography of Dennis Banks, um, and this is one of the images that was taken of the ghost dance ritual. By March 6th, the Denver AIM chapter and Crusade for Justice, with the support of Black and Brown Berets, organized a march with over 1,200 people on Colfax Avenue in solidarity with the Wounded Knee occupation. The crusade received calls about solidarity protests in other parts of the US and Mexico, but there were no news outlets that covered these solidarity efforts. The FBI began to monitor the solidarity even more closely between Denver AIM and the Crusade for Justice. You can find, again, more information on this in the work of Ernesto Vigil and the Crusade for Justice. On March 11th, Ogallala chiefs and the headmen uh, created a series of demands, including a written declaration that the Treaty of 1868 be revived so their tribe could be recognized as a sovereign nation. Ogallala leadership sent a delegation to Washington, D.C. to attempt to negotiate with the U.S. government as well as to meet with the United Nations to further their sovereignty. By April 5th, Kent Fitz Fritzel, U.S. government official, signed an agreement with the Ogallala Sioux agreeing to six out of the 10 demands that were presented um, by Ogallala leadership. And this was actually signed in front of the media. This included an agreement to hold congressional hearings on the continuing validity of the Treaty of Fort Laramie from 1868 and a meeting at the White House. By April 15th, negotiations relating to the agreement signed by Fritzel failed in Washington, D.C. And so leaders of the Ogallala Nation returned back to Wounded Knee. On April 17th, federal marshals and the National Guard cut off electricity and water to the town and attempted to prevent food and ammunition from being passed to the occupiers at Wounded Knee. The Ogallala Sioux and AIM leadership organized alternative systems to bring in supplies from outside supporters and found alternative methods to communicate. One of the most infamous events was an airdrop of food and supplies organized by Bill Zimmerman and other supporters. By May 8th, the Wounded Knee occupation ended. After Wounded Knee, many AIM leaders were targeted with lawsuits for their participation in the occupation. AIM formed a legal counsel during Wounded Knee occupation and engaged strong attorneys to represent them. However, the impact of so many legal trials at once strained AIM's leadership, many of whom went underground after the occupation due to also being responsive um, to local actions in the years prior, starting with Alcatraz. AIM then focused a great deal of their efforts on fundraising to cover the costs of legal fees to fight these often long and drawn out legal battles using the courts as a form of repression of AIM's efforts, along with the increased infiltration by federal agents, the US government was able to stifle some of the momentum that the American Indian movement had gained. The FBI and CIA used many infiltration techniques and tactics, which fostered a great amount of paranoia within AIM. 
And in chapter 19 of the Ojibwa warrior Dennis Banks and the rise of the American Indian movement, written by Banks and Air Roads, it notes how one of the most prominent infiltrators was a man named Doug Durham, who worked for the FBI and employed a variety of strategies, including befriending Banks. Although many AIM's le AIM leaders um, and members were suspicious of Durham, Banks continuously ignored their warnings, defending Durham as someone loyal and trustworthy. It was later confirmed that Durham did in fact work for the FBI when Vernon Belcourt obtained a signed 302 form, which was used for reporting on assignments for FBI agents and from an AIM lawyer regarding a case in Phoenix, Arizona. AIM leaders chose not to immediately confront Durham in hopes to expose other informants and infiltrators in their movement. But eventually, AIM leadership did confront Durham, and when they confronted him in Des Moines, Iowa, with the signed 302 form, he admitted to working with the FBI and revealed other tactics he used to effectively infiltrate and disrupt AIM. Durham also openly admitted his role with the FBI at a press conference and later made his career as an anti-AIM speaker. Some of the subsequent but most notable victories after Wounded Knee occupation are documented by Laura Waterman Whitstock and Elaine S. Lenas in a brief history of the American Indian Movement, which you can find on the American Indian uh, Movement website. Many of the noted achievements focus on local organizations, especially in Minnesota, the birthplace of the movement and present day headquarters to the Grand Governing Council which oversees and connects with supporting local chapters. Overall, the continual focus of AIM has core values of self-determination and solidarity in the ongoing fight for indigenous sovereignty. While not all AIM chapters are affiliated with the Grand Governing Council due to a split that happened in 1993 um, at the International Confederation of Autonomous Chapters here in Denver, Colorado, many are still active and work in solidarity with modern native-led efforts. Waterman and Woodstock, Waterman, Woodstock and Salinas emphasize how AIM's focus on spiritual renewal and interconnection between native peoples continues to be one of the greatest achievements because of how spirituality continues to empower many native people and nations to reconnect with their culture and to sustain it for generations to come. So what are some of the strategies and actions that we can learn from this movement? First, um, when we look to the early history, is that community initiatives and programs were locally based and they met the needs of direct people, whether this was um, you know, the AIM Patrol to um, creating legal centers, creating schools, but also creating um, initiatives and actions that were focused on reclamation of land, and that being also very specifically locally focused to the native people of different areas and regions. Additionally, something that was used was strategic escalation. Occupations were not the first step of many of these different actions that took place. There was, there was attempts for negotiation. There was attempts for meeting with um, U.S. Federal, federal government officials. There were attempts at other means of intervention, but when nothing else worked, occupations were used as part of that escalation strategy. Um, conferences as well continue to be very important. Caravans and um, having groups of large people attend court hearings or attend um, different events such as the Trail of Broken Treaties and even coordinating that in a national effort. Um, direct actions, right? And which also included nonviolent direct action, um, picketing and negotiation. So obviously there's a lot to learn and I've been talking for a long time, but let's hear from the wisdom of some of our panelists. Um, I first wanna invite Donna Christian, who is a citizen of the Sikchangnu Lakota Nation and a descendant of the Diné Nation. She is a native of Denver, Colorado, and a mother of five. Donna is an indigenous education consultant, has been presenting the indigenous perspective for over 46 years. 
She also works with several organizations as a diversity and inclusion consultant and presenter. Donna stays active in the Native community, both locally and nationally, by volunteering and participating in several organizations. Donna serves currently on the Denver American Indian Commission, the Chinook Fund Board of Directors, where she was the former co-chair, and the Board of Directors of the People of the Sacred Land. Let's welcome up Donna. Also would like to introduce our next panelist, Dr. Angela Parker, who's an enrolled member of three affiliated tribes, the Madan, Hitsta, Cree, of Fort Bethel Indian, Indian Reservation in North Dakota, and participates at her father's reservation, the Rocky Boy Indian Reservation in Montana. Angela earned her Bachelor's of Arts in History from Stanford University and her Master's and PhD in 20th Century United States and Native American History from the University of Michigan Ann Arbor. She currently teaches as an Assistant Professor of History at the University of Denver, and her research focuses on 20th Century Native American and U.S. history, particularly the long 20th century history of oil extraction in indigenous communities, the evolution of tribal sovereignty, and native activism. Angela lives in Boulder, Colorado, with her partner and their son. Let's welcome up Dr. Parker. All right, um, to start things off, I would love to ask a question to you, Dr. Parker. Um, knowing that much of your research is focused um, on Native activism, in researching the history around the American Indian movement, the majority of archival resources and written histories either come from men who are leaders of AIM or from the US government. How do you see this um, impact the way that we learn and understand the history? Um, and are there any resources where we can learn more from Native women? Absolutely. Um, so when you uh, assume, right, that the American Indian movement is the full expression of red power, then um, you are going to be drawn into a world that is largely male. Um, AIM was sort of notoriously effective at getting the microphone <laughs> and being in front of cameras. And so um, in particular, you know, some of the leaders that you identified, um, you know, Dennis Banks and Russell Means and the Belcourts, um, they were very effective organizers and they were very effective at media strategy. Um, to the point where, uh, you know, they became sort of the voice of a movement that was actually much broader based. Um, the other thing I would say is that um, when you look back into the origins of red power as opposed to only AIM, um, what you see is that before AIM was formed in 1968, um, the sort of initial um, organization that began to use that terminology, red power, and to organize um, across communities was the National Indian Youth Council. And this came from um, the Chicago conference that happened in 1960, and this sort of frustration that Native youth had with um, older community members who wanted to take a more like accommodationist tone. And so they decided to um, create the National Indian Youth Council. One of the organizers, Hank Adams, um, he uh, did an amazing amount of work um, in Washington, I think mostly Washington, maybe parts of Oregon with like the Fishins. Um, and what AIM really did, I think, effectively was to take the same strategies that Hank Adams had begun 
and to deploy them in um, you know the history that you shared with us so effectively just now. Um, so, okay, let's go back to this Red Power mom moment and National Indian Youth Council. Um, Denver actually plays a really central role in the origin of Red Power. Mm -hmm. And it's not a male history necessarily, like it's very broad based. Um, so uh, the epilogue of the book that I'm kind of currently putting to bed, it should be out next fall with OU Press. Um, I talk about my auntie. <laughs> it always starts with an auntie. <laughs> um, I talk about my aunt Tilly Walker and she was an activist in the Denver area working for an organization called the United Scholarship Service. And United Scholarship Service um, took uh, sort of the funding from religious organizations and deployed it to um, identify high achieving native youth and to place them in boarding schools, like sort of elite boarding schools throughout the US West and on the East Coast. Um, so she had a lot of access to um, this sort of, you know, group of youth. Um, she was also just extremely um, active. And one of the intersections that I think is really, really important for Denver is that um, both Tilly Walker and um, Corky Gonzalez were organizers for the Poor People's Campaign. Mm -hmm. And this was like a crucible of organizing um, and so for those of you that don't know, Poor People's Campaign, it was the last movement that Dr. King was working on um, before he was assassinated. And it was an attempt to really combat a lot of what you were talking about in terms of um, this primacy of white supremacy in making sure that people don't organize based on class, um, you know, issues that uh, poor people have in common. Um, so uh, both Corky Gonzalez and Tilly Walker were drawn into that organizing. You know, they got to um, spend time with SCLC, with Dr. King. And after Dr. King was assassinated, they continued to organize and to participate in the actions at Resurrection City in DC. That became a key moment for a lot of those organizers with the uh, Poor People's Campaign. Um, both around how to organize across community differences, um, but then also they brought that learning back to places like Denver. So um, some of the students that had been involved with the United Scholarship Service and with the National Indian Youth Council decided to organize an occupation actually here in Littleton, which I don't know if anybody else, yeah, okay. So um, there had been a group of uh, employees at the Littleton BIA plant that um, were native that weren't getting promoted and they were you know, being treated really shoddily and discriminated against. And so they filed a class action lawsuit eventually um, and they, called, they were called kind of the Littleton 12. And so one of um, the students that had been in sort of the United Scholarship Service and National Indian Youth Council orbit, his name is Bruce Davies and he's still um, alive. He's in Washington State right now. Um, he organized and went to the White Buffalo Council and, and basically went around to a lot of native organizations to um, put into place a picketing and then later an occupation of the Littleton plant the reason I'm getting into all this and never give a historian a microphone because we always talk too much <laughs> is um, that occupation and the demands that came out of that occupation eventually led to a class action campaign to confirm Indian preference in hiring and promotion in the BIA. Mm -hmm. And um, this is a, a case that eventually went all the way up to the Supreme Court. It was called Morton v. Mankari. I think it was 1974. Mm -hmm. And this is still um, crucial federal Indian law and it remains the cornerstone of cases that support things like ICWA, the Indian Child Welfare Act. And so um, with the most recent decision that came down, Brackeen v. Hayland, um, that was an attempt to, to undermine and essentially to destroy the Indian Child Welfare Act. Um, 
they uh, drew upon Morton v. Mankari. Um, the finding from Morton v. Mankari was that um, Native identity is not a racial designation, it's a political designation, and it's based on this uh, long history of, of treaty making with tribal communities. And so because it's a political designation, um, that is why Indian preference um, you know, continues to be legal despite like the Civil Rights Act and that type of thing. So, I mean, here was a seed, it started in Littleton, it started with this really local organizing here in Denver, and it continues to be influential today in terms of um, you know, the legal basis for supporting native rights. Um, and it's, it is like a hidden history. We don't have a lot of information about it. People talk about it in families, but there may be, there's nothing like written about it. And I'm gonna say something, we can give like a hot take, right? <laughs> I think it's because the AIM leaders were really, really great at taking up all the oxygen in the room. And I think it's important, this is an important history of AIM. Like these are essential things in community organizing that happened. But there's a reason why we hear about AIM and we don't hear about WARN, which is Women of All Red Nations, which did groundbreaking work in exposing um, involuntary sterilization of Native women. Um, you know, <laughs> Uh, focus on human rights in addition to women's rights and children's rights. Um, and I think part of the reason why AIM was so effective is because the white gaze wants to see Indian warriors, like someone they can fetishize as like, oh, there's that Indian warrior with his long hair and his, you know, Che Guevara hat <laughs> and, you know, his big belt buckle. And so it's what white people want to see. Yeah, thank you for that. Thank you for like adding on to that local history. And wow, you like uh, when you mentioned more and that like made me transport back to like one of my classes <laughs> for feminist philosophy. But um, but yeah, Donna, I would love to hear from you too. And something that you shared with me is that your parents were involved with AIM in San Francisco. Um, and, and other organizations, of course, too, um, including different actions like the occupation of Alcatraz, the walk to DC, the BIA takeover, Wounded Knee, Columbus Day protests, and, and so many other things that they continue to do today. Um, and so I'm curious, you know, how did your parents' involvement with AIM influence your life? Um, and social justice, really, how did that influence your life and, and your leadership today? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm just going to introduce myself. Hama Takiapi, Donna Christiani, Machapi Kisto, Iuha Chante, Washte, Nape, Chizapi. So I'm Sichangu, Lakota, and Dene. My mother is Sichangu from Rosebud, South Dakota. Um, my father is Dene, so uh, from um, Arizona, Loop, Arizona. And um, I'm going to tell a, a longer story. <laughs> Then um, and then I'll get to the answer of the question, but um, my parents were involved um, in they are boarding school survivors Both my mom and my dad were taken away from their homes. My grandfather was also a boarding school survivor. So um, the the termination policies um, In our lifetimes have impacted my family and I'm still living in that trauma, right? So actively they are still killing us I have a friend that tells me every time I call him his answer is Donna We were born into a war and the first time I heard him say that I kind of giggled about it because he was really strong In what he said and I didn't know what I, I didn't know if he was making a joke and then after he explained what that meant And now I understand and hundred percent we're born into a war um, because they haven't stopped trying to kill us. So one is genocide is happening. Two, they took our kids, removed them from their homes, and placed them in boarding schools, and that impacted my family and, uh, and all indigenous people. And then the last one is our blood quantum policy, right? Where we're, they couldn't get rid of us by killing us. They couldn't get rid of us fast enough by assimilating us. So now we're going to get rid of you on paper. Um, so those three policies um, in effect today um, still impact our families and our trauma. So my parents then being part of the boarding school and surviving that 
were then also part of the relocation program, which um, put them in a different city. Then I'm far away from their community. So another act of assimilation. So they were first moved to, um, to San Francisco. So my dad was placed in boarding school in Arizona. My mom was placed in boarding school in Stefan, South Dakota. Um, and then they were moved to, to San Francisco. Now, my mom went to go work in a pot factory. And um, my father went to go install air conditioning units. Um, they met on a blind date. And then here we are. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, the combination of tribal nations that I am, being Lakota and Dene, um, is not usual, wasn't usual then. So when we say these combinations, you're like, oh, were you a Haskell baby, which is also, um, which is a school in Kansas, um, a vocational school where children could go um, to go away to school and learn a trade, which then eventually became a university, um, or you're a relocation baby. So um, that is me. Um, so my parents were in San Francisco during the civil rights movement movement in the 60s. So my brother was born there. My, my two older brothers were born in San Francisco before they moved to Denver. So my when we talk about this assimilation policies and then this, um, specifically the blood quantum policy, um, the hope was with the with these relocation programs um, and, and other programs to move us off the reservation, the hope was that we would marry outside of our race. What they didn't account for was that we would find other Indians in the cities that we were placed at. <laughs> So we wanted to be around each other, and that's where we went. We, we gravitated toward each other, built services and Indian centers in cities across the country. So that obviously is what happened to my mom and dad, and that's how they met. But also being a part of a social community and then participating in civil rights movements such as AIM and such as the occupation of Alcatraz. So my mom... Now I'm going to get to some funny stuff about this. Um, growing up, my mom used to say, so I grew up in a small farm town in Nebraska. Um, we moved there when I, in 1975 when I was three. So she divorced my dad and we moved to Nebraska. So my mom, I always looked at her as like the native Martha Stewart. So she always had an apron on. She's baking cookies. Like she's making sure we do our homework. Like I'm not kidding you. My mom was the native Martha Stewart. But she would drop these nuggets on us every now and then where she'd say, I have an FBI file. And you're like, whatever. I'm like, what, what are you talking about, crazy? And, and then she would say things like, I, I don't know, just out of the blue about her, um, it's trauma, right? So in that moment, she's triggered by trauma. So she's dropping other uh, things that have happened to her in her, in her past. And um, she never connected those dots for us growing up, but I heard it. Now, let's, let's move forward to in my 20s. I'm living in Denver. I was going to a pride Pride parade with my uncle. We're walking in the back streets of Denver to get to the parade, and we walk in front of this church. And he says, "This is my mom's youngest brother." And uh, she, he says, um, "Hey, that's that church we got shot at in." It's like what? <laughs> and I, I'm like, whatever. And he's like, "No, look, you can see the bullet holes like in the steps." And I'm, I'm like, "Why were people shooting at you? What are you talking about?" And he said, so during Wounded Knee, they were, um, and that's in your research too, where they were um, protesting or gathering here in Denver, and the FBI were chasing them, so they sought um, sanctuary in the church. And Brown Pride was helping them here in, in Denver, and they were chased and shot at, and they shot back at the FBI. So he's telling me this story. I'm like, that did not happen. I just didn't believe it, right? Because I never heard these stories. So then I asked my mom. Now, fast forward again, the opening of the National Museum of the American Indian. I was there, and I, I helped open it that year, 2004. My mom came to visit. And I had all these booklets, all these, these fun little things from the, the opening. And um, she's flipping through this big magazine. And it was like the who's who of Native America was in Washington, D.C. for that opening. And she's flipping through this book. She's like, oh, that guy. Oh, that guy. 
like like mad about it, like ah. And um, I just was like, what, mom? So then I, I set her back down and we go to the beginning of the book. I'm like, how do you know this person? And she goes, well, back in 1971. And she starts telling me these stories of AIM without saying AIM and telling me um, her connection to all of these different um, people, all of these leaders in our community. And uh, it was fascinating to me, because also while growing up, so I was born in 1972, and here in Denver, my, so my mom is the oldest of eight, so her siblings lived here and we grew up here. Um, we would come back to powwows at the Indian Center, and Russell Means would be there, and you know some of the other AIM members, and uh, my mom was always joking around with them, but never introducing us at the same time, right? Never taking ownership of the friendship or the relationship. Um, so it, it was fascinating, right, to watch this go on and then for her to tell all these stories of all of these people later in my life. So now I'm, I'm starting to connect these dots, right, in my 30s of, of this FBI file that exists. And then these um, relationships that I saw when I was younger and all, all of the things that my uncle told me. And I started asking her, um, were you a part of AIM? And she goes, who was a part of AIM? Nobody was a part of AIM in that time. I, she just denied it. And to this day, if I ask her, she would probably still deny it for the very same reason that she stated. They went into hiding. They hid their information, tried to hide their identity so that nobody would come look for them and ask them questions because these court cases were happening. So what I did find out um, was my mom had me in 1972, wounded me, the occupation wounded me happened a year later, and they were transporting, my mom would transport medical supplies. And uh, she did that with me because she would steal medical supplies by taking me to the doctor. And then she would take me up there. So um, no, I was like her safekeeping, right? So one of the events that happened um, that my uncle told me, he's, he said, uh, he told me, excuse my language, but he said, your mom is a badass. I'm like, no, she's Martha Stewart, right? So um, my auntie, her, one of her youngest sisters, um, got butted by a rifle and was dragged across that line by the FBI. And my mom walked right over there and dragged her back. And she said, they're going to have to kill both of us and dragged her back by her hair. So my uncle told me this story, and I didn't believe that either. And, I, and when I asked her, she said, that might have happened. So I don't get clear confirmation, right? But there's a lot of circling around about it. Um, but it, it has been a part of my life. Um, so when I read your question last night, I was sitting there thinking to myself, um, how, how has this um, motivated me and inspired me? So I asked my husband, and because um, he knows me better, like, how is this inspiring? And um, he said, seeing your mom as a mom, as an everyday person, that can make huge impact in the story of Native people. This is a huge inspiration. So my mom started talking to schools in 1977 when I was five, and I went with her because I'm the baby. Now, my mom always said my dad asked her to start doing these presentations because she knew so much, and her answer was always, I'm just a mom. Who's going to listen to me? So I grew up with that. But I also grew up seeing her be a leader, somebody not willing to back down, somebody who told me every day you know exactly who you are. Stand up for yourself. Nobody can tell you who you are. You know who you are. And that's what's inspiring about that, is that all of these organizing, all of this work that we did, was done by um, our family members, our, our aunties, our, our uncles, our cousins, our moms, and our dads, who um, 
were fighting for us. They didn't care so much about putting themselves on the line because they wanted to give us a better future and a better opportunity. So um, that, that's what that movement has done. And all those silly antics, right? That's a huge story to circle around to. But I had to tell you all of that because I didn't realize it while I was growing up. And, um, and that was intentional for her to lie to us about it. I'm, and I still think if I asked her today, she'd probably just laugh and say, the FBI could look for me. If they wanted to arrest me, they could have. I heard that. That was the other thing. Yeah, if they wanted to arrest me, they could. I'm like, what are you talking about? But so, um, yeah, and I had um, my aunties and my uncles um, involved in the movement as well, um, who probably would still deny it today, too. Um, my, my husband's uncle, we went home in Ontario, Canada, and um, <laughs> the first time I met him, told him where I was from, and he said, oh, I was there in 1978 for the first Sundance. And I was like, what? So then we were laughing at your timeline, talking about your timeline tonight, and I asked him, I said, I wonder if your uncle was there in all of those events too, which he probably was. So anyways, yeah, there's my answer. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, um, trying to see. I'm like, we're covering so much. Um, I think my other question for you, Dr. Parker, is what do you believe is important for current community organizers and activists to learn from the history of AIM as well as the Red Power Movement? I think I would just double down on what you just said, which is that the only way we can make change is through our connections to each other and um, you know, when you think about like your mom taking you as a little baby and like gathering medical supplies, or you think about, I mean, there were women who were, um, loading up like a hiking backpack and like bringing supplies into Wounded Knee, um, you know, or anybody who was involved in sort of cross community organizing, um, those didn't just happen, um, by, people showing up to a meeting, <laughs> they happen because they were like friends and they um, had reciprocity, right? And these communities were really showing up for each other in really important ways. Um, and it's always that human connection and being a good relative, I think, that is the basis for um, any sort of effective organizing, at least historically. <laughs> Yeah, and it's interesting, like, kind of going back to what you were saying about the Poor People's Campaign and what you're saying, too, about your mom, Donna, is, like, um, you know, as a, okay, a few things. One, in each one of these series, we have to come back to the Poor People's Campaign and that moment of, like, really important intersection. I mean, I remember Shirley Romero talking about that from, you know, San Luis land rights struggle and, um, Reis Terejina from New Mexico, as well as Corky, like, were there, um, who were obviously very influential in the Chicano movement. And, like, I think that's the other thing, right? As I um, did my best to try to, you know, find as many sources as I could to tell some of the story of Wounded Knee, something that was clear was that solidarity, right? Like, how um, it wasn't just AIM. Obviously, it was very much the leadership of Ogalala, themselves but you know there were black panthers that showed up there were members here from the crusade that went including ernesto like <laughs> right who writes about that account um meant just many different um points of intersection and i think about ray otero too for the san luis land rights struggle and how his experience at wounded knee really um charged him right in his community organizing encouraged him to see like oh, we need to make a newspaper, right? We need to, you know, like create awareness about these things. And, you know, I think um, just each point of, each one of these points in these moments. And the other thing too, Donna, that what you're saying about your mom is just like so many community leaders that I've worked with throughout the years are like, but I'm just a fill in the blank, right? But it's like when we tap into that power, you know, like thinking it's like, yeah, your mom is a mom. And she was a very creative, like, you know, mother to think about, like, and how can I not just, like, keep my child safe and my children safe, 
but how can I like keep generations to come like with a path, you know, just that the, the vision, the foresight of everything that really comes with, with that. Um, before we open up to questions from the audience, I would love to hear a little bit more about the work you're doing with um, the Project for Sacred Land mm -hmm. and, and how can people be engaged and involved with that work? Um, yeah, I, I'll just um, say a little bit more about my mom and her intro. Um, so I heard that, I hear that every time she does a presentation, she says that. That's her opener for her presentation. Um, so it it's kind of led me to where I am um, in the way that I introduce myself to. I'm horrible at writing bios and I'm horrible at introducing myself. I'll just say, I'm a mom and I'm done. Um, but even that, being a mom um, and that statement alone, I have five children and in Lakota way, we believe our children choose us. And they live in the stars and they, they come down and they choose us. And that it changes a little bit of that responsibility, right? That these little loving hearts chose me to, to guide them and to help them in, the, in this world. And um, it just makes me forever grateful for that. And that my most important role, all, all those other things that I do, um, the most important role is to be a mom. And, um, and I take it very seriously. So my kids might laugh at that by me saying that, but <laughs> I do take it seriously. Um, so the work that I do in community, um, I do serve in several capacities, but um, the latest one, I've joined the people of the sacred land and I serve on their board of directors. What we created was a truth and reconciliation education commission. Now, what this commission does, or what we have done so far, is we have tried to find researchers from different tribal nations that historically called Colorado home and were removed from the state of Colorado um, in, a, in a particular time frame, right? So we're talking about um, when settler colonialism was starting to come here and we're looking at um, gold being discovered, um, other things, right? Trying to build um, trade routes, use our trade routes to get through the Rocky Mountains and then um, build that tra the train that went through the Rocky Mountains to connect to the West Coast. So we're, we're looking at a historical time period from all of these different tribal nations from our perspective, not from the white settler perspective. What happened to us? What, what were we doing in, in an actionable um, time period? Like what, what was our action in these, in these moments? Um, so we're gathering that information and that research um, to work toward reconciliation efforts here in the state of Colorado. And we want to present a land assessment um, and our project so that we can work on reconciliation with the state of Colorado and all of the entities um, about land. So how were we removed? How did that impact us? Who died? Um, it's some of the research is hard to hear because you have to listen to the deaths and then the way that death happened and the way that death came to us. So um, uh, all for land. And um, we're almost done with our research. So um, I'm missing um, a meeting tonight. I mean, it's okay, they're recorded, so I can listen to them again. Um, and it's a good thing they're recorded because I revisit them often uh, to hear what, to, to relearn and to really digest the information um, so that we can make these changes. So we do have some active efforts um, with this uh, assessment, this land assessment report. Um, and we're hoping to get the state of Colorado and uh, different cities uh, to join in this reconciliation effort that we're asking for. So, yeah. Thank you. Thanks yeah. for sharing. Yeah. Thanks for 
both of you and all the work that you're doing. Um, I'm curious if our audience has any questions for our panelists, any questions about the content we went over, anyone online? Yeah. Not all at once, you know? <laughs> Hi, uh, my question is uh, concerning Leonard Petir. Have you, what's going on with him? Is there any way we could help in the release of him? They, they just did a caravan, right, to, to free Leonard Pel Peltier this, um, was just a month ago, wasn't it, or August? Mm -hmm. Did you see that? Yeah, Indian, Indian Collective organized that um, and asked relatives to go, and they did a march in Washington, D.C., asking uh, for clemency for him ag again. Um, I think just the continuation of letter writing, um, continuing to ask our representatives in Congress and the House uh, to support that effort and to bring it to the president's attention um, consistently and constantly um, because we would like to see him home in his final days and resting easy um, with his people in his final days. Yes, mm -hmm. continue to do that. Um, also look for the efforts um, that are done and organized by Indian Collective or any other Native organization that does that work, such as going to D.C. and participating in protests and marches. Um, the more numbers we have, the better voice we have. So if, if that's at all possible for you to participate in those, then, then please do. Yeah, and one other action um, that's coming up is the National Day of Mourning, where there's usually a delegation um, for Leonard Peltier that provides updates um, and letter and read letters from him um, to people and on the best ways to take action. Um, they now live stream that since 2020. Um, so there's a way for you to just look that up on YouTube, National Day of Mourning Action, and you can tune into that. It's on the East Coast time, so... Um, a little early for us over here in Denver, but lots of really important updates about what's happening for Native people across the Americas. I would also just, I guess, encourage people to move beyond a singular focus on one person. And I think we all hope that Leonard Peltier is able to spend his final years, you know, being cared for and not, you know, a part of the carceral state. I mean, no question. And I'm guessing that most people in Native communities today would also say, you know, we need funding and help with the fentanyl epidemic. We need more people who give a shit about drugs being transported to reservation communities and our youth and various people being preyed on. And there are so many issues, right, in Indian country that need attention. We need people, we need allies and people who are supporting on these issues, but they're not centered around one person. They're around things that require you to, to slow down and spend time and actually get to know a community in a deep and meaningful way. And so what I would say is, you know, if you're in Colorado, one of the things you might think about is to build relationships with Ute Mountain in particular. Um, you know, they were shoved to the very edge of Colorado because they refused to allot their lands. And so, you know, Southern Ute has a good relationship with Ute Mountain. Um, However, if you look at what are the needs, like the educational needs, the healthcare needs, um, you know, right here in Colorado, it's major and they get zero a time, zero attention. And, um, you know, people who are in the front range don't seem to care at all about the fact that 
Ute Mountain has been just systematically discriminated against because they chose not to allot their lands, you know, with that, with that timeline. Um, so, I mean, I would just encourage people to, I guess, start, start really locally. This is specifically from someone online. Uh, I was wondering specifically about the occupation of Fort Lewis College or any other AIM activity in Durango, Colorado. Um, I don't know about that occupation, so I can't speak to it. And yeah, I don't, I don't think we have that information. I know Fort Lewis is doing a really good job of um, contending with their history as you know, initially like a, a land grant boarding school. Um, and so, and they have an amazing archive over there. Um, we just visited, um, you know, me and a colleague, a few colleagues from the University of Denver. They have a huge cache of like oral histories that they're maintaining there. Um, so unfortunately, I don't have information about it, but my guess is that people at, at Fort Lewis, like the archivist there, um, I think it's called the Center for the American West or the, I can't remember the exact name right now. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. But they have really great resources, really great faculty. Um, their Native American Studies program is exceptional. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, I would uh, point people in their direction. Mm -hmm. So a little different type of question. I'm a television producer, and I was out in UCLA for a special screening of Reservoir Dogs with the original creators. And they had a Q&A, and they were talking about how they really made the choice of having more of a realistic depiction of what indigenous people are like today. And I was wondering, with shows like that and Killers of the Flower Moon, what is your take on how indigenous people are represented today versus 10, 20 years ago, I guess? I'll just say I love reservation dogs. <laughs> um, it is going in the right direction with those shows, yes. Um, Killers of the Flower Moon, uh, hiring of Osage consultants and historians, um, making sure that the costuming went through Osage. So Scorsese didn't just ask them to come and inform him one time. He had them sitting next to him in the chair, um, informing him throughout the, the filming. So um, that changes, of course, right? The narrative and the, the course in filmmaking um, for, for us. Um, I, I will say good things about it. So <laughs> I'll end on that. But... Um, Reservation Dogs and um, what's the other one? Rutherford Falls. Um, both of them moving us into a contemporary way of life is crucial for people to see, um, to know and to understand that we are still here. Um, we are wildly and wickedly funny um, that all of these um, areas of concern impacts us every single day, even as kids. Um, there is no separation between education and healthcare, MMIR. There's no, they're all the same and they're all important. So, um, not all the same. They're all, they're all of the same importance to us. So, um, and, and I don't, if that was not highlighted enough in that series, um, that is an underlying message throughout it. So um, just really crucial to be able to see us in contemporary light. Yeah. So I don't know what your thoughts were, but Rutherford Falls, the um, episode with the pretendian, yeah. <laughs> was probably one of my favorite TV moments <laughs> of the past decade. Um, but also with reservation dogs, and I mean, thinking about the impact of boarding schools, of suicide in our communities, especially amongst our youth. Um, 
I think it's a really important, important series that is going to continue to be important moving forward. And, um, you know, when you think about like the Dear Woman backstory episode right. where, you know, you're taken into this space and you're having to like, you know, realize how frightening and alienating it was to be a little, a little kid, you know, in a boarding school. Um, I think that was a really important representation. Um, and I would just say the other, you know, moment that I think balances it and is also so, so true about Native communities is there was an episode where Willie Jack went into the prison to see her auntie. And um, there's like this moment where, you know, they're praying together and you just see like all these like ancestors that are behind Willie Jack and they're like there supporting her and loving her. And that is Native America too. Like it's not, you know, just the negatives. It's like this real legacy of strength and survival and love and care, similar to what you're talking about, you know, with the importance of being a mom and how your mom fought to make a better world you know, for you and for her grandkids and their grandkids. Um, you know, Reservation Dogs in particular, I think, was really effective at showing that real beautiful part of Native America in a, just as it was really good at, at showing these difficult moments. Other questions? Maybe we should do what I do in class. You guys can leave once you've asked three more questions. Yeah. Just kidding. <laughs> My students hate it when I do that. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, my question is around, um, Celeste spoke about like spiritual and cultural practices, both like as a form of direct action at Wounded Knee, the, the sweat ceremonies, um, bringing back the ghost dance. So I basically just wanna ask about those things, um, more about the history, maybe current practice of those, of those things. Um, and it just, it made me think of it. I saw Dr. Rosales Mesa was talking about um, self-care recently in, in light of um, militaristic genocide of, of Palestinian people, people turning away from that um, towards like self-care and talking about self-care as an individual practice being like a colonial paradigm of white settlers doing that like in their home and alone. So I thought it was really powerful being doing this in public and a form of political action. So anything more you could share about that? I think I'll just say very like quickly that for me, prayer is a form of self-care and I'm not, I'm not Christian. I kind of wish I was cause then I could go to church, <laughs> but um, <laughs> you know, like, and not that I know or um, Thank you. <laughs> yeah. that's okay. <laughs> but um, you know, uh, I don't know. Like, I'm not well-versed, I guess, in sort of the deep beliefs of my community, but I know enough how to pray, right? And it's this moment where you can connect with your relatives that have passed on before you that, you know, are there still supporting you and who love you. And it's a way to express hope for the future. So, like, when I pray, I always, you know, try to remember everyone in my family and be like, you know, please watch over them, help them, you know, live a, in a strong way, you know, like live well, protect them from like harm, that type of thing. I mean, there are things that, you know, are the same in indigenous beliefs and like Christian beliefs and Hindu beliefs and Jewish beliefs and, you know, Islam, like 
we all love our family. We all want our families to be safe and cared for and free from violence and free from danger. And so, I mean, there are these moments where, um, you know, what's happening in Israel and in Gaza and Palestine right now is not going to be fixed by my prayer, right? It's not going to be fixed by me like meditating or <laughs> doing anything else. But when you feel like you don't have the structural power to do anything, um, I do think it is powerful to bend your mind to this idea of I want the best for other people and I'm going to put my intention out there. Yeah, I I definitely echo that. That's um My mom being boarding school survivor um, didn't grow up with her traditional ways. So then when um, the, the 60s movement right started to happen and she was part of it, um, wanted to take herself home to learn and uh, to have understanding. So we were part of um, our spiritual, our spirituality and um, our different ceremonies back home um, as, as babies, as children. Uh, so I do feel very um, privileged in that regard. That's a horrible word to use. Um, but the only reason I use it is I know that it's um, not everybody gets that opportunity. And I did as a child and, and now as an adult. Um, but I also grew up very Catholic odd until um my uh, until i became an adult and so now i just say i'm a recovering catholic but um yeah <laughs> um but i i will say the same, same thing that prayer can be seen as self-care and the number one way to reconnect yourself and ground yourself um i don't i don't um pray very often publicly um, or do prayer for groups. Um, I've been asked on a on two. I can remember two occasions, um, and I am getting to that age in life where um, I might be the oldest in the room. Uh, so I never. So I just did a prayer that um, I would hear from back home or with my people. And um, afterward, one of it was with a non-native group, half non-native, half native, and uh, one of the ladies afterwards said that I was a prayer warrior, and I just thought to myself, like, I'm gonna add that to my email tag. Why? Well, just kidding. But uh, <laughs> not right. <laughs> Um, she's so good for my soul right now because <laughs> she gets my jokes. So anyways, um, but the what I didn't realize is that the way that we pray is um, significantly different than Christian way of praying. Um, like she said, in the way that we ask for, um, we're, we're really humble and we ask for health and wellness and we ask for um, everyone to be healthy um, and well. Not, not just me, but everybody around us. So then I can also feel healthy and well and loved um, if everyone around me is the same. So, and there are no definitions to that. I think that every person has their own way of looking at health and wellness. So whatever that means for you is, is what that means in that prayer. Um, and I don't think that, I don't know, it, it just looks different for us um, in those moments. And I didn't realize it until that moment for me, um, because I was just praying the way that we normally would. And um, I didn't think it was necessarily special. I just thought it was uh, the way that we pray. So uh, I, I will add, sorry to this too, that um, I don't necessarily... Uh, believe in self-care, in the word self-care. Um, I get asked that a lot because I am um, really busy in, in my life, and I, 
I think I'm not, like I, I'll tell my husband, I don't have anything going on next week, whatever. And then I'm gone all, all day. But um, I do get asked what to do for self-care. I don't, I don't go to the spa. I rarely have time to read books um, or to take time off, right? Um, so how do I remain happy and feel that health and wellness for myself is um, in the advocacy of my people. This is hard work and it's fulfilling and it, it warms my heart to be able to talk about my life experience in the hopes that it changes the narrative for our people and for my kids and my grandkids and the seven generations to follow. That um, That is what self-care is to me, not, not a body scrub or, or massage. So um, although I appreciate those things, I just think that um, it looks different for us. And um, I feel really um, full after events like this where I'm able to share and talk and laugh. So, um, yeah. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, yeah, this will be our last question. So my question for you guys is, um, you spoke about your mother and how much she was uh, important to your upbringing and everything. So do you practice the same thing with your children? Do you try to bring your children also along with this? Thank you. Uh, yes, um, as much as possible, as much as they they want to, or I force them. So <laughs> that that's a both and um, because most most of my kids are teenagers now, and um, so I have a funny story. When I was a teenager, um, I didn't want to go to one of our presentations, and I was just dragging myself along, and um, my mom was getting really upset with me about it. And, um, you know, when you're a teenager, everything sucks. It's like, this sucks. I don't want to go. You suck. I don't want to go. <laughs> and I, we get inside the school, and she yanks me and says, um, you need to get it together. And I'm all, you suck even more. And then, you know, just really getting after me. And uh, she, she said to me, we have an opportunity today today to make a difference for one person. That's our goal, is one person. But that one person can change generations. So you need to put your happy face on, whatever you gotta do, <laughs> and I'm okay. So still, you know, upset about it, but that resonated with me. And I tell this story often, because in that moment I decided, I don't wanna be angry about this work anymore. I want to feel good about it. And I want to be the most approachable native person you will ever meet. I want you to ask me every and any question because that's the only way we're going to learn. And that's the only way this gets better for both of us is if we share. So I made that decision when I was little, when I was in my teens. So I know how important these moments are. Even if my kids think I suck in that moment, I make them go. And my baby girl, she's 13, she still likes to come with me because she thinks, I'm gonna get something out of this if I spend time with mom, at least Starbucks, <laughs> but, um, which is not a good thing right now, so sorry. Dunkin' Donuts. But um, they, they really do appreciate um, being in these moments um, with me and and hearing about it. And I hope this um, elevates their voice and their way of knowing that they can make a difference too. Um, so yeah, I do make them go. I'm currently in a life and death battle against my son's iPad. <laughs> and... <laughs> He's actually here with us tonight. He's sitting in the back with my partner. <laughs> and it's kind of scary. I might need to talk to you afterwards because my son is 11 now. And so we're entering the phase where like, oh, God, you're just so uncool. You have no idea what, you know, this type of YouTube video is. And I don't know. 
Um, we don't either. <laughs> we don't either. We fake it. <laughs> but um, I think, you know, in in the times when we're, you know, spending time together without the iPad on, <laughs> um, I think the most powerful lessons that I probably learned as a human being come from him and from just like, you know, hearing his perspective and learning how to treat another person with like dignity and respect. And like, I don't always get it right, right? As parents, we don't always get it right. But, um, you know, we're so lucky that these little people chose us and that they um, are willing to teach us. Well, thank you both so much um, for sharing so much with us this evening. And um, I think in that spirit, you know, like part of why this history is so important is because it's for us to learn for the generations to come, but also for this moment now, you know, like to that question earlier around <clears throat> reviving like certain rituals and ceremonies, like one visual that I saw this week was seeing like Palestinian people dancing in Gaza even with like bombs exploding around them, they're still dancing, right? And um, and just seeing that connection of solidarity of like their dance and the ways that you know there are, there are those dances that are prayers, like all those different rituals are so important because it's a part of the culture of what keeps our people alive, right? So, um, anyways, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, there. I didn't touch upon this and I thought about it. Uh, there's language around, right, reclaiming or, um, or um, identifying again, reconnecting. Um, so I pushed back on that. I don't think we're reclaiming our identity. We are who we are. We have always been this way. These ceremonies, these prayers, and these cultural ways of life live in us, in each one of us. And there is no reclaiming that. If we just know it, you just have to know it and be a part of it. And I accept your identity, accept what, what lives and breathes in your soul and in your heart. So I push back on that idea of reclaiming. Um, because we just are already and we exist and um, there is no reconnecting to a ceremony just go 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 home and be with family be around your people um, however that identity shows up for you um, just go and do it and that's not reclaiming or reconnecting it's just being who you are so I, I push back on that Again, thank you both. We'd love to give our panelists a round of applause. Um, as we conclude our time together um, and this series, I just, again, want to thank the Colorado Trust for financially supporting this work. Um, I want to uh, thank Wafa Saeed for supporting with the coordination of all the logistics, Alejandra with all of the Zooms, um, Joanna for continuing to just support this capacity building for our, our movements, our um, social justice ecosystem. Um, wanna express gratitude to Regis University and the Office of Diversity and Inclusion Excellence, especially to Nikki Gonzalez and the work studies who have supported us for each one of these series um, to our AV. Uh, Brandon with Denver Open Media, and to each and every one of you who attended, you know, tonight as well as other sessions that throughout this fall together. Um, as far as next steps, um, there will be um, recordings of each one of these sessions made available in English and in Spanish on my website um, at this link of celestialalegria.com slash poped or um, as well as the at the Colorado Trust website. So when those become available, hopefully in December, <laughs> um, we will we will be sharing that with you. Um, and thank you again for being a part of of this important moment and this important work. Have a good evening. Thank you.